from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's coming up. K-State's Alex Shanian and Terry Griffin will take a look at how the generational makeup of a farm impacts the rate that farm adopts new precision cropping technology. This is part of that ongoing multi-layered analysis of farm management decisions made by the differing farming generations. Also today, K-State's J.P. Michaud comments on what he calls the mounting concerns with neonicotinoid crop seed treatments, saying that the use of these insecticides is harming off-target beneficial insect populations and causing environmental issues. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee shares some facts this week about venomous snakes in Kansas. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Thanks for tuning in. This is Agriculture Today. If you've been listening the past few days, you'll know that a team of agricultural economists here at Kansas State University has been delving deeply into the latest years of Kansas Farm Management Association data and looking at the generational makeup of our farms involved in the KFMA around Kansas and and what that means in as far as farm management tendencies. Now, we talked earlier, yesterday as a matter of fact, about how those generations affect decisions about purchasing and adopting farm technologies and precision technologies as the years go by. Well, taking that one further, our guests have looked at the adoption patterns of farmers regarding all of this. Joining us once again is K-State's Terry Griffin, and along with Terry this time around, Alex Shanigan, who is an agricultural economist as well here at the University. Terry, go back, if you would, to the general idea behind this overall analysis before we go any further. So the KFMA data is really rich in many aspects. It has financial and agronomic production information, but it also has a lot of information about the operator characteristics, uh, how old they are, what year they were born, their experience level when they began farming, and the number of operators on each farm. So we decided to dig a little bit deeper and look at these uh, descriptive statistics. And and we were sitting there in uh, our little team meeting one day, and, and Alex suggested, well, you know, it'd be really neat if we framed these instead of by simply age, but by generation. So we decided to, you know, they were born between what, 1981 and 1996. Instead of just saying age, we'd say millennial. And and that might uh, spark some more interest. So, you know, uh, to review that, you know, the silent generation, these folks are in the mid-70s and older uh, right now, born before 1945. Baby boomers were the next oldest, born between 1946 and 1964. So they're mid-50s to mid-70s today. Uh, generation X, born between 1965 and 1980. They're in basically in their 40s to about 55 years old. Millennials, you know, um, Post-college age from 23 to 38 years old, born between 1981 and 1996. And then we have a handful of farms um, in, in our database who are Generation Z, uh, but they're all going to be less than 22 uh, years old. So they're actually, if you were born today, you would be Generation Z. But Alex, when we look at the adoption of technologies generally in agriculture, you and other economists tend to categorize those specifically in rather unique terms, innovators and early adopters, and then from there. Um, and this is not just specific to agriculture. This is more of a technology adoption or innovation adoption research in any types of innovation. Whenever it's introduced, there are different groups of people who are adopting in different stages. So some people adopt it right away. Some people line up in front of the Apple store when the new iPhone comes up. Others wait until a year or two passes before they buy 
the one or once it's on sale. So there are different categories in literature to categorize this type of consumers or people. It starts with innovators. Those are the early groups and then early adopters and then early majority and then late majority and then the laggards will be the last group of people who adopt the technology. So is there a natural relationship between those stages, if you will, and those age demographics, those generations that Terry talked about? It's a good question. The general preconception is that usually the younger people tend to be more of an early adopters or early majority. And that's what you see in a lot of technology and a good example to look around in, in your household and usually the youngest members of your household have, have the latest cell phones or latest technologies. But what is interesting is that within each age group or generation group, they also might be early adopters or late adopters or early majority. So what was interesting is to find out, especially for farming community where we know that the average age of farmers is very high. So we said, okay, then within that generation group, what are the characteristics of early adopters and what are the characteristics of late adopters? So if you have a person who is 25-year-old and a person who is 50-year-old, the conventional wisdom is the younger person will more likely be early adopter. But what if you have two 50-year-olds and one of them ended up adopting earlier than the other one. Why is that? Mm -hmm. And those were the, some of the questions we wanted to look deeper into. Yeah. And Terry, quickly, you might give the rundown of the specific technologies that you were examining within the framework of this analysis. So with the KFMA data set, we uh, had listed over 10 technologies, but there's eight that stand out as being uh, enough to have a sample size for analyses. Automated guidance, which is the most widely used technology in Kansas, probably in the United States. Automated session control, which includes sprayer, automated booms, and uh, planter row shutoffs. Uh, yield monitors, with and without GPS, uh, that'd be the first four. Grid soil sampling would be another one. Uh, light bar guidance, many of our listeners may remember light bar, many of them are still using them. One of the earliest technologies available. Uh, variable rate fertility and variable rate seeding on planters. Now, Terry, you and Alex are in the preliminary stages of this work. We must stress that. So there's a lot to be uncovered yet here. Have you two found any distinctive trends that you can hang your hat on in this relationship? Well, you know, if you've heard me on the radio before, I talk a lot about two types of precision ag. One of them is automated, you know, it's the guidance and the automated section control and planter uh, sh row shutoffs. And then the other side is uh, the data intensive stuff like yield monitors and grid soil sampling and rubber rate controllers. Well, we are definitely seeing a difference between those two groups. So, for instance, the technologies reached early adopter stage sooner after leaving the innovator stage for automated guidance, automated session control, the automated technologies. The data technologies took longer than the automated technologies to go from innovator to complete early adopter stages. Mm -hmm. So in general, uh, automated technologies are adopted sooner. And the younger generation were in the innovator compared to early adopter, except for one technology. And that technology was automated guidance. For some reason, automated guidance, the early adopters were younger than the innovators. And there's several things we could discuss about how that's different than other ag technologies. And one is that it's sort of standard equipment on, on new tractors and combine harvesters and sprayers. So maybe a function of people who are investing in new equipment will have that technology built in. Mm -hmm. Alex, what stood out to you as you looked at this early data now as far as trends that are, are worth noting here? In general, the trends here are also consistent with that conventional wisdom that the younger people are more likely to adopt. But what is interesting is depending on a technology, this varies a little bit. And I think that's because of the other factors that enter into this. So how complex is the technology? What are the specific benefits of it? So if the technology is very complex, you would expect the younger people maybe to adopt 
it earlier if the benefits are a little bit directed towards uh, comfort or making it easier to operate the machinery, for example, you would expect to see more of uh, older generation representatives to adopt it earlier. So it's not very black and white. There are many different factors that go into this that can affect the rate of adoption by generations. When you consider that this particular exercise can generate a heap of information, why is it important? What is the interest in having all of this on hand, ultimately? There are three main groups, stakeholder groups, that can benefit from the insight generated from this type of research. The first one, agriculture producers, farmers themselves, who will uh, need to become aware of new technologies as they become introduced, learn about their costs and benefits and their applicability to their own production systems, two, make informed adoption decision, and third, optimize the use of it. The second stakeholder group will be the producers of these technologies who will need to successfully introduce, market, and maximize the adoption of these technologies. And then the third stakeholder group who can potentially benefit from the insight generated by this research are the extension educators who will be working with farmers from different generations, from different adopter groups to help them understand, become familiar, make informed decisions about adoption and optimize the use of it. Terry, as you're working with your other colleagues as well on the various layers of this analysis, when do you hope to have something posted out there from the efforts that you and Alex are putting together here? So we have at least three uh, articles in the series. The first one, my goal is to have it online by July 1. And the remaining two, online before end of summer, which let's say end of August. And that would include what we're talking about today, and that is the technology adoption patterns on the part of farmers and how those tie into those generational differences from farm to farm. Terry, Alex, thanks for coming over, sharing what you found so far. Thanks, Eric. Great being here. Thank you for having us. From the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State, Alex Sanian and Terry Griffin. This is Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is the K-State Radio Network, and welcome back to Agriculture Today. We're visiting now with a research entomologist at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, and he works routinely with crop insect pest problems and remedies for those. J.P. Michaud is with us once more. We'll visit with J.P. today about a certain insecticide product out there common in our crops. It is, in fact, an insecticidal seed treatment, and some of the pros and cons of these products. They are called, J.P., Neonicotinoid seed treatments, and before we go any further, I want you to give a quick definition of what those are. Well, it's a whole family of compounds that are analogs of nicotine, essentially, which is a naturally evolved insecticide in the, nicotine, in the tobacco plant. And so they're just basically uh, variations on that molecule uh, that have been developed synthetically over the years. And they've been very popular because they have good systemic activity in the plants. The plants can take them up from a soil drench, or, and they'll go all through the plant. And basically anything that, that bites on the plant will be poisoned. Now, one of their advantages was, in fact, that they're relatively safe for most vertebrates because our nerve membranes are not – we don't have the receptors for them to bind. So – they're much more safe than other groups of insecticides in terms of their uh, dangers to vertebrates. However, invertebrates, many of them, and not only insects, are affected by these chemicals. And they bur- when they do bind to membranes, they do so irreversibly. 
And that means that longer-lived ones over time can accumulate a lethal dose, even from very low concentrations in their environment. And unfortunately, the same properties, chemical properties, that make them such good uh, systemic insecticides within plants also mean that they move quite readily in groundwater. They are very mobile. A single rainfall event can result in the flushing of as much as 6% of neonicotinoid insecticide out of the field and into you know, groundwater. So this is a concern because we're finding that we're actually uh, losing a lot of diversity in aquatic arthropods and invertebrates are dying because of this. And this is one of the reasons the European Union has banned this entire group of insecticides. So it, it is a concern because really we don't need them in most applications. They have a niche. So if you were planting, let's say, into a field where you knew you had a big population of seed-destroying insects, it would be a wise idea to use a seed treatment. The problem now is that the seed companies want to treat all the seed. This is not good. This, we might as well be back in the 1950s where we use insecticides in a preventive manner. This is not IPM. This is not good IPM practice. In fact, it's counter to the very basic principles of IPM, that you only use an insecticide when it's economically justifiable. Mm-hmm. So one of the consequences of this now is that the farmers are being asked to pay an extra input cost that they don't really need. And it really doesn't do anything to raise their yields and almost you know, 95% of applications. So that's not really fair in my view. If I was a farmer, I'd be up in arms about that. I I think input costs for the crops are are quite uh, high enough. Another thing is that these things are everywhere in the environment now, albeit at low levels so far. But, you know, if we were to stop using them today, it would probably take 10 or 15 years to get rid of what's already out there. And I don't know if you like to go fishing or if you like to go hunting pheasants, but, you know, these ecosystems are completely at risk because of these, uh, these insecticides. They're going to take away their food supply in the rivers and the lakes and the insects that the baby pheasants need to eat. They're very indiscriminate. So this is, this is basically my concern. Mm-hmm. Now, and when we speak of integrated pest management, or IPM, as we have in the past, you have often uh, included in that conversation the beneficial insects that are part of an insect control program for protecting crops. Those beneficials would also be vulnerable to the neonicotinoid class? Absolutely, and we've done work on that in our lab uh, to demonstrate that. We have a number of publications on that topic. So what happens is these chemicals can be taken up by adjacent plants. So little wildflowers that might be sources of nectar and pollen for our lady beetles and our lacewings and our beneficial wasps, these types of plant resources that they consume also get contaminated. And then, even with sublethal doses, these insects' behavior and biology can be severely compromised, so they may as well not even be alive. So that's a concern. And think about it. If you're going to kill everything that tries to feed on your plant in the field for the first, uh, depending on what kind of plant it is, three to six weeks of, of growth, then you're going to have a sterile environment where you won't have any natural enemies at all because there's nothing for them to eat. So you've basically abandoned natural pest control for that whole crop, or at least the first half of it. So that's not good. And again, a prophylactic or preventive use of this material is just cannot be justified at these latitudes that we have here in Kansas. This is an issue that has been bandied about, as you said, the European Union has uh, moved forward with abolishing the use of these. Uh, Here in the U.S., uh, these have been under discussion, maybe under some court litigation. So where is this headed, do you think, J.P.? Well, uh, as a producer actually uh, sent me a link yesterday, apparently there's at least 20 different formulations where the EPA has actually reversed registration and withdrawn it. So that's very unusual. Once they usually provide registration as an expensive process, so uh, they don't usually reverse them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what's going on with the seed treatments, but I think it's up to the farmers and the consumers to demand that they access at least a seed that hasn't been treated. They're paying for something they don't need. And besides, isn't the free market supposed to give us a choice? Are there alternatives to these compounds that could protect seed from those uh, seedling insects? Well, there are other groups of chemicals that are investigating as seed treatments, and one, for example, is chloranthramilaprole, which is 
probably safer, um, definitely a lot safer. It's a completely different mode of action. But I don't, from what I see, it's probably not as effective as a seed treatment. And it's not, you know, there's really no reason to use a seed treatment, as I said, unless you know you've got a specific type of problem out there, something as a, a big population of wireworms that's going to be attacking your seeds right at germination. You know, that's the only time you'd ever want to use something like that. But over the years, people, uh, you know, they've, they've just managed to sort of, you know, incrementally, you know, apply this to all the seeds. You see, the seed dealers don't want to store seeds separately. They don't want to have to store untreated seeds separately from treated seed. But really, they should go back to giving us all untreated seed. And it should only be treated in specific situations where there's a real justification for it. So your real hope here, JP, in closing, is that a, a dialogue start to form, if it hasn't already, about the future of these and alternative approaches to protecting crop seed. Absolutely. And, you know, just to finish up with one other point, you know, mm -hmm. when they do break down, some of the breakdown compounds are just as toxic as the parent compound. Mm -hmm. So it takes a long time before they get to something that is not toxic. Well, there is some dialogue about these out there already. There's likely to be more, and again, you're encouraging producers to be part of that conversation in that these are so much a standard on our crop seeds these days, these neonicotinoid insecticidal seed treatments. And JP, thanks for the perspective on this. We appreciate it very much. Always my pleasure, Eric. J.P. Michaud, and he is a research entomologist at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes. And speaking of that center, ahead of the break here, we'd like to remind you once again that the center at Hayes will be hosting its annual Weed Management Field Day a week from today, Tuesday, July the 2nd. This event will include full discussions and demonstrations on weed control in corn, soybeans, grain sorghum, and sunflower production. This will run from 8 in the morning until around 1.30 in the afternoon. There will be a showcase of the herbicide options for weed control in corn and a herbicide drift simulation for soybeans. Other topics will include emergence and growth of palmer amaranth populations, and, of course, herbicide options for grain sorghum, soybeans, and sunflowers. There is no cost to attend this field day. Lunch will be provided, but they are asking you to pre-register online at hayes.kstate.edu or call the Research Center at 785-625-3425. Again, that number is 785-625-3425. Commercial applicator certification and continuing education credits are available for those interested. The field day co-sponsored by the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Sorghum Checkoff, the Kansas Sunflower Commission, and the National Sunflower Association, along with a host of commercial herbicide interests. The 2019 Weed Management Field Day at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, starting at 8 in the morning, a week from today, Tuesday, July the 2nd. We hope you producers can get away and take this fine program in. You are listening to Agriculture Today. Now this break, after which we'll bring you today's agricultural news headlines, also awaiting K-State's Mike Brook with this week's edition of Milk Lines, and K-State's Charlie Lee standing by for his weekly wildlife segment. All that still to come here on the K-State Radio Network. Stay with us. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson here. 
Well, what row crop planting is left in Kansas is still bogged down by the uncooperative weather, as indicated in this week's Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report from the USDA. For the week ending this past Sunday, our top soil moisture in the state, 26% surplus, 72% adequate, and 2% short to very short. Subsoil moisture, 25% surplus, 74% adequate, and only 1% short to very short. The condition of the winter wheat crop in the state, 56%, good to excellent, 28% fair, 16% poor to very poor. Wheat mature, now at 47%, and the harvest but 5% complete now, well behind the 36% for the five-year average. Condition of corn in Kansas, 50% good to excellent, 37% fair, and 13% poor to very poor. Corn emergence at 92% now, corn silking at 3%. And the soybean crop in the state, 41% good to excellent, 44% fair, and 13% poor to very poor. Soybean planting, 84% complete now, behind the 90% average yet emergence at 68%. Grain sorghum crop condition, 67% good to excellent, 30% fair, and 3% poor to very poor. Sorghum planting is at 77%. That is behind the average of 88% for the date. Range and pasture conditions this week, 78% good to excellent, 20% fair, and 2% poor to very poor. As for the view on the national crop conditions and planting progress now, we turn to the USDA's Stephanie Ho. The weather this week has not been kind to farmers. Wetness intensified in some parts of the nation's midsection, particularly from the central plains into the Ohio Valley, leading to a worsening situation for some crops. That was USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. Planting progress finally approaching completion for corn 96% on June 23rd. Of course, in a normal year, 100% planted. Last year, 100% of the corn planted by June 23rd. He adds that only 80% of intended corn acres have been planted in Ohio. And a number of other states, 7 to 9% left to plant. That list includes Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, and Wisconsin. Meanwhile, he says corn condition has slipped a little, dropping from 59 to 56 percent good to excellent, and increasing from 10 to 12 percent very poor to poor. Rippy has the latest on the nation's soybean crop. A tough week in some of the southern production areas in the Midwest. Only 85 percent of the U.S. soybeans planted by June 23rd, well behind the five-year average of 97 percent, and last year's 100 percent. He points out the states that still have at least a quarter of intended acreage left to plant. On the top of that list is Ohio with 65 percent planted, therefore 35 percent left to plant. Missouri, 66 percent planted. Michigan, 69 percent. And Indiana, 75 percent. He has this year's first look at soybean condition. We do have 54 percent of the crop rated good to excellent. That is the good news, I suppose. 10% very poor to poor, but if you look at that compared to last year, we were at 73% good to excellent, just 5% very poor to poor. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Time now for the weekly segment for you dairy producers, Milk Lines. Here's K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning, well, how hot is actually too hot for your dairy cattle. What I'm talking about is... With their core body temperature, as they experience heat stress, the core body temperature rises. So how hot is too hot? You know, it's interesting as we think about that. We could think about that on the basis of losses in milk production. We could think about it on losses of reproductive performance. And today I'd like to visit about what happens in terms of reproductive performance. We've got quite a bit of good data out there today that really tells us that when the cow's body temperature exceeds 102.2, conception rates drop very significantly. So how would you know whether or not your animals have body temperatures that are exceeding that amount? Well, there's lots of different things you could do. Obviously, you have thermometers on your farm. You could go take a whole bunch of rectal temperatures, but there's some simple things that you can do too. One of those things is just simply count respiration rates. As we look at the respiration rate data that's available, and again, there's really a ton of information from research studies out there to give us good guidance. Animals 
their breathing rate, when it starts to exceed 40 breaths per minute, that's when they actually start experiencing heat stress. Based on correlations of various studies, it looks like when their breathing rate exceeds 60 breaths per minute, that's when we will start to see a rise in body temperature. Many times producers ask me, so, you know, you have this body temperature of 102.2, and we know that conception rates drop off from that. How long does she have to be above 102.2 before we see a loss in reproductive performance? Well, some of the studies that have actually looked at that and tried to define that, they actually, in their studies, they defined an animal that was cooled was an animal that never exceeded 102.2 versus animals that had body temperatures greater than that. So from those studies, it would indicate that, you know, it probably doesn't take a very long time above 102.2 before we actually have an issue in terms of reproductive performance. Again, as the body temperature rises, one of the first things she's going to shut down is her reproductive organs and concentrate on basically surviving and continuing to produce milk. So here's an important thing for you to think about as a dairy farmer. If we have poor reproductive performance during the summer months because we're not cooling our cows adequately, that means that they will probably become pregnant in October and November. When are they going to calve? Now we force them into a cycle where they're going to calve during the summer months the following year. Think about that. Think about the added stress that we've now put on her because we didn't get her pregnant when we should have, because we weren't cooling her in the previous lactation as adequately as we should. So as you think about these issues, I encourage you as dairy farmers to look at the respiration rates in your herds. Best time to check that would probably be in the afternoon hours probably about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So you look to see what maximum respiration rates are. Likely we'd see them between about 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. in the afternoon. If you're seeing respiration rates above 60, probably going to have some issues with conception rates. So what's the solution to that? Better cow cooling so that we can keep those animals at a lower respiration rate i.e. a lower body temperature, that will actually help increase our reproductive performance in our herds during the summer months. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And you're tuned to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. you now on this Agriculture Today, our weekly get-together on wildlife management topics. Charlie Lee is aboard once again, wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Charlie, filling folks in today with some facts that they may not be aware of on venomous snakes in Kansas, which are abundant. Well, we certainly have a few venomous snakes in Kansas, and sometimes just the sight of a snake makes people recoil with horror or disgust, uh, the chances that that observation is a venomous snake is actually fairly low. Kansas has uh, 38 species of snakes. Uh, Six of those species are venomous. Uh, One of those actually uh, that some people consider an introduced species is the western diamondback, but other information shows that isolated individuals were found in the south central Kansas uh, many years ago. But we have the Western Diamondback plus the five others, and folks are familiar with their their names, the Timber Rattlesnake, the Massasagua, Cottonmouth, Copperhead, and there's one more, the... The Western Rattlesnake, or the old, used to be called the Prairie Rattlesnake. So those would be uh, in the group Pit Vipers, which are only the only venomous snakes that we have that are native to Kansas. Here in the U.S., almost... 90% of the venomous snakes are pit vipers. There are a few 
of the species of coral snakes that are also found in the U.S., but none of those in Kansas. There's approximately five to 7,000 folks that are bitten each year by pit vipers in the United States. You know, that sounds scary. It's kind of misleading. About 50% of those people that were bitten were actually handling the snake. Hmm. And then there is a fair number, uh, maybe as much as 20 to 30% of those that are bitten by a venomous snake, that the snake did not inject venom. So I get a lot of questions about venomous snakes uh, or poisonous snakes. And I think it's important that we remind people that there is a difference between poison and venom. Explain that, if you would. Well, poisons are substances that are toxic or that can cause harm if you swallow or inhale them. Venoms are generally not toxic if swallowed, but typically are injected under the skin by snakes or spiders into tissues that then are typically protected by skin in order to make them toxic. So we've certainly had numerous people bitten by rattlesnakes each year in Kansas, but it appears to be not particularly a very fatal event. Which of the six species we find regularly in Kansas would be the most venomous, or is that understood? Well, there's been lots of opportunity for people to to look at uh, venomous snakes and try to determine which ones are more venomous than others. The most toxic venom of the U.S. species snakes would be of the eastern diamondback. But actually, that only ranks about in the top 20 of the most toxic venoms of other snakes that are found throughout the world. Uh, The larger snakes, like eastern diamondbacks, western diamondbacks, or even timber rattlesnakes, typically can inject a larger volume of venom. And it's the volume of venom that typically kind of determines the lethality. Once again, though the risk may be much lower than most would think, the point is if one doesn't engage the snake, so to speak, directly, the the chances are somewhat low that there'll be harm done? Well, certainly the rank's fairly low compared to other activities or accidental causes in the United States. It's three times more likely to have a fatal dog bite than it is a snake bite. And it's very infrequent compared to deaths from uh, lung cancer or cars or motorcycle accidents or even lightning. So I typically try to recommend a three-part proactive approach to dealing with snakes. And the first is learn to identify those species that are venomous. Uh, Then you can avoid those. Uh, Then take some steps to prevent negative encounters with snakes. And then plan for worst-case scenario or for emergencies. Fairly simple, but I think by just following that simple approach, you can be well-equipped to deal peacefully with snakes. When you say planning for the potential of a snake encounter, what would that entail exactly? Well, there are lots of things you can do to prevent negative encounters with snakes. First, try to avoid killing the snake in your yard. That's usually not the, the solution. I think it's more appropriate to try to make your yard and home less attractive to snakes. Keep in mind that many of the people that have been bitten by venomous snakes were attempting to handle the snake. So oftentimes that's going to increase your risk. There are some species of snakes that actually eat other species of snakes. So just removing one snake from a yard doesn't mean that others are not going to find the yard. So you need to do some things, what I call negative wildlife management in your yard, Try to remove some of the the habitat that snakes find attractive in your yard or snake-proof your yard. If you've got tall grass, uh, overgrown shrubs and piles of brush and firewood piles, uh, those might provide hiding places for snakes. Tall grass can make it difficult to watch where you're stepping, uh, which also uh, makes hiding areas for snakes and makes cover. So remove the cover, try to remove some of the food supplies for the species of snakes that you find in, in your yard, and do a good job with your, with your landscaping. Items such as rock walls are going to provide more shelter for snakes than walls that were poured and mortared together. You can also snake-proof your home and other structures around the home. 
uh, whether that's your garage or shed or outbuildings. Try to tighten it up. Make sure all of the holes and cracks and crevices are sealed. Door sweeps and under the garage door thresholds are certainly places that snakes have an opportunity to enter the home. Small gaps uh, where wiring or plumbing enters the the home also are, are opportunities for snakes to enter. Pet doors are also a, another easy access point for snakes. And then finally, make sure you do a good job of rodent proofing your home. Many of the venomous snakes are particularly after small rodents to eat, and oftentimes that's small rodents. So keep those out of your home. You're going to reduce the food supply. Uh, less likely to have a negative encounter with a snake. There's some important background to have in mind about venomous snake species in Kansas. We appreciate the word, Charlie. Many thanks. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. That is our time for today. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.